In this video, we're going to take a look at the new features found in Substance Painter 2018.3. Let's start by taking a look at the improved mirror symmetry tool. So here I have just a standard layer and we're just going to paint a stroke. Now first let's just enable symmetry. So here at the top of the UI I have my symmetry option. I'm just going to enable this. And you'll see that one of the improvements we've made is to display the symmetry plane as an intersection of the mesh as you can see here. Now if we come over here to our symmetry options I can also choose to enable the symmetry plane. I can also toggle the visibility of the intersection as well. So let's just turn off the plane and let's just use this show intersection. You'll also notice that we've added this new manipulator. This allows us to interactively adjust the symmetry axis here in the 3D view. So for example, I'm just going to mouse over the plane, just left click and drag and you see and you can see that I can adjust the symmetry axis. So here we will just offset here the symmetry axis and then I'll start to just paint a stroke. And here we can see the result. So here if we come back to the symmetry options, we can also adjust the manipulator size or choose to show or hide the manipulator. So next, we're going to take a look at some UI UX changes to the layer stack. So we can now assign a color swatch to a layer or a layer group. So for example, I have this surface details. I'm going to right click on this layer and you can see here that I have a set of color swatches. Uh, for the surface details, I'm just going to assign it this red color. And you can see now we've basically tagged this layer with this red color, allowing us to quickly identify any specific content for a layer. As I said, we can also do this for an entire uh, group. So for example, here we have this bronze armor folder. If I just uh, right click this guy here and I'm gonna set this to blue, you can see that it sets uh, the group and all the layers within this group to have this blue color swatch assigned to it. Now, again, our surface details, which we've already tagged this with the red swatch, it still retains that original setting. We can also just right click on a group and if I want to uh, remove the color swatch, I can simply just choose this first option here which will remove that color. Another feature that we've implemented here in the layer stack is the ability to quickly activate or deactivate layers and effects. So for example, if I just come over here to a layer, I can just left click and drag to quickly deactivate a group of layers. I can also left click and drag again to reactivate these layers. This also works with effects. So for example, here I have this fill layer and you can see that I have uh, some effects assigned here. I can just left click and drag to quickly deselect or left click and drag to re-enable those effects as well. We've also had the ability to quickly change a blending mode. So for example, let's come over here to this edge damages. I'm going to alt left click here on the mask and uh, here we have just a single generator. I'm actually gonna come over here to my effects and I'm going to add, uh, let's add a fill and here I'm going to just choose a grunge map. So uh, here I'll just choose one of these grunge maps here. Uh, let me just make a quick adjustment here. We'll up our contrast. Okay, so now we have uh, this grunge map on top of our generator and I'm gonna come over here to my blending modes and I'm gonna switch this to say multiply. So now that I can see using the blending mode how I'm combining these two effects to build up my mask. I can use the up and down arrow keys to quickly switch through all the different blending modes. So here I'm going to start hitting my uh, the down arrow key and you can see that I'm able to navigate through my blending modes to find the precise mode that I want to work with. So for example here I might just uh, go with uh, subtract. So here again I'll hit M on the keyboard to go back to my material mode. In this release we've also added the capability to export the 2D view. This has been a long requested feature and it's really good for those who are working on mobile projects where they'd like to be able to export the 2D view with the lighting baked in. So to help facilitate this, we've also improved the bake lighting filter. So here in my shelf, I'm just going to uh, find here where I have my filters and I'm going to use this uh, bake lighting environment. So I'm just going to drag and drop this here to the top of my layer stack. So now that it's been applied, I'm going to uh, switch my mode here to the base color channel. And now I need to set an environment map. This new version of the baked lighting filter interprets the environment map in a much more accurate way, closely reflecting the results of the PBR shader. It can also take into account painted details on the normal and height channels. 
So to demonstrate this, let's go ahead and add our environment map. So I'm just going to click my button here. I'm just filtering uh, my resources here in the mini shelf. And I'm just going to choose this uh, Corsica Beach map. So I'll just left click uh, to apply this. So uh, another improvement here to the baked lighting uh, filter is that we can now adjust the horizontal and vertical rotation. So you can see here I can do that uh, using these controls. So like I said, this filter will now also uh, correctly take into account any painted details on the normal and height channels. So let me demonstrate that here. I am going to create a new standard layer. I'm doing this below my baked lighting filter. And I'm going to come over here to my material, and you can see that I'm just going to be painting on the normal channel. And if I come over here to my hard surfaces, what I've done here is just applied one of the hard surfaces to the normal channel. So now I can just start to uh, paint something here. Now you'll notice that uh, as I bring my brush into the view, it's not really showing the normal, it's just showing this kind of black circle. The reason that's happening is because I'm actually in this base color channel. So if I just hit M on the keyboard to go to my material mode, and for now I could just disable this baked lighting environment, I can now more precisely paint the details. So uh, just to demonstrate this, I'm just going to just stamp in this normal detail here, and I've done that here in my 2D view. All right, so now uh, let's just re-enable my bake lighting uh, environment layer with the filter applied. I'm going to hit C on the keyboard to toggle over to my base color. And so now you can see that this detail that I painted on the normal channel is, is now accounted for here by the baked lighting filter. Once again, I can adjust my horizontal rotation, and you can see how that detail, that normal detail that we just painted, is being updated. Okay, so once we have this set uh, the way that we like, we can then export this 2D view. And so to do that, we're going to come over here to the top of the UI. I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to choose my Export Textures. And in the configuration, we've added a new option here. You'll see it at the very top of the configuration list, which is 2D view. And you can come in and set whatever resolution you would like, as well as your image format, uh, set the destination, and then just simply export to export the 2D view. And since we've used this new bake lighting environment filter, we've baked all of our lighting, and we have a nice result, especially if I'm wanting to use this texture uh, in a mobile project. We now have a new temporal anti-aliasing setting for our display. So I'm going to come over here to the display settings, and I can activate it here. So I'm just going to enable or activate the temporal anti-aliasing. This new method ensures smooth edges at all times. And it will also smooth out dithering caused by subsurface scattering or transparency shaders. This will allow you to use the alpha mask shader to preview clean, smooth, artifact-free transparency. So here you'll notice that if I come over here to my shader settings, I am using the PBR Metal Rough with Alpha Test. And on this shader, we also have a new alpha dithering option as well. So here I'll just enable this, and it works well on smooth alpha gradients. We will also automatically apply dithering on export to the normal map. In this release, we've added a new anisotropic shader. You can see how this shader is used in the sample preview sphere project. So you can just go to File, Open Sample, and choose Preview Sphere. So here, if I come over to my shader settings, you'll see that I'm using the new PBR Metal Rough Anisotropy Angle Shader. This shader is going to use the anisotropic angle and level channels. So let's take a look at how that's set up. We're going to come over here to our texture set settings, and you can see that I've added the new channels here for anisotropy angle as well as anisotropy level. Now, if we take a look here at the anisotropy group, you can see here that we have a fill layer which has the channels enabled with a uniform value set for the anisotropic angle and level. In this example, we're using two fill effects. So let's take a look at the first one here. You can see that it's actually using a specific noise radial scratches gradient here for the anisotropic angle, and the fill below that is using a gradient circular pattern here for the anisotropy angle. In this release of Substance Painter, we've also included all new content to work specifically with the anisotropic shader. So here you can see in the shelf, I'm just filtering based on anisotropic, and you can see all of the new noises and gradients that we have added here so that you can easily work with this new shader. In this release, Substance Painter is now using sparse virtual textures in its real-time viewport to manage large amounts of textures. 
This technology allows you to stream in and out textures that are only necessary from a given point of view in order to maintain a specific footprint on the GPU memory. Simply put, it improves performances on projects with a large amount of texture sets or UDIMs. Sparse virtual textures are a type of texture which are not complete. This means the application only loads parts of the textures in memory. Only what is needed is loaded and the rest is put into the system memory or on disk, a cache. When needed again, the textures are retrieved from the cache and put back into the viewport. To make transfers quick enough, the system relies on mitmaps and jumps between different resolutions of the textures rapidly. So if we come up here to edit and go to our settings under the general tab, here I'm just going to scroll down, you'll see where we have the sparse virtual texture where you can actually enable the hardware support acceleration. Now there are specific configurations that are actually supported. So be sure to check our documentation to see if the GPU you have is supported. Also here where you see temporary files is where we can set the specific cache directory. We are continuing on our path to a full UV tile support and this release includes a completely rewritten memory and texture management system. This means lower recommended specs and the ability to load an enormous amount of data in the tool. And if you don't plan to work with large assets, you can still enjoy the noticeable leap forward in performance. So this is going to close out this video. Uh, just a quick walkthrough on what's new in 2018.3. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.